Hi, everyone. Welcome to Webinar Wednesday today. We thank you so much for being here, and we thank our trainer, Nick Kramer, for presenting Scaling Agile today. Um, we really appreciate everyone's time. I know this may be a lunch hour for you all, so thank you so much for, for being here. And we'll start in just a moment. Uh, I just want to let you all know that this is being recorded, and it will be up on our YouTube channel. It'll also be on our site at accelerate.com slash library slash videos, and we'll be sending you out the the URL and just to just tell you very quickly a little bit about accelerate we've been in business for almost 20 years and we teach a lot of training every year all over the US worldwide but now of course mostly online and everyone's done a really good job of um, of, of doing that now and people seem to be used to it and it's going great um, we do teach a lot of agile thanks to one of our top trainers Nick here um, but we also teach programming languages, uh, Microsoft technologies, data science, DevOps, and a lot more. Um, but today, of course, we're here to talk about Agile training. And uh, if you go to our site, accelerate.com slash agile dash training, you'll see we have a lot of courses there. Um, but any of those classes can be customized for your team of three or more. And um, Nick, who's here with us today, is actually really great at customizing classes and making sure that the class goes exactly with what the group needs um, and what their goals are. And um, we've had the pleasure of working with Nick for about three years now. Nick has taught a lot of classes with us and he's got a ton of real world experience that he brings into the classroom because he is actually an agile trainer, coach, leadership coach, uh, scrum master, product owner, and he also recently has been certified in um, a couple of different Agile topics, a Scrum at Scale Practitioner, he's a, a registered Scrum Master, registered product owner, and um, Scrum at Scale Foundations, which is like a four-hour um, seminar. And so these, these things actually take at least a year to get. It's not like anyone can just uh, go and get these things. So congratulations, Nick. This is, this is a very recent accomplishment. So very cool. Um, and He's, he's taught many classes for us as well over the three years. And uh, if you haven't seen Nick teach, you are in for a treat. Um, he, and I, I'd like to say that he's also awesome behind the scenes, just as good as he is in front of a classroom. So I'm gonna let you, I'm gonna stop gushing and let you see for yourself. Um, so Nick, I'm gonna go ahead and make you the presenter. Okay, let me. And it should be all you. All right, let me share my screen. I'm assuming everybody can see that. Can you see that now? No, you cannot. No, I cannot see your screen. <laughs> there we go. There we go. Oh, that's right. actually my screen. Oh no, that is your screen. That is your screen. <laughs> okay, good. Well, welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Nick. I'm not gonna leave this camera on. I'm not gonna subject yourself to me all this time. Um, uh, what Ann set the bar awfully hard, high there for uh, uh, my training skills. So here we go. Uh, yes, this is a class on, not a class, this is a webinar on Scrum at Scale. Now, scaling is one of the big, huge topics that's in the Agile space right now. So we are going to spend some time talking about it. I would like to encourage you all, if you have questions, to drop them in the questions box inside of the GoToWebinar, or you can even drop something in the chat. I'm actually watching both of those uh, simultaneously, and I'll be happy to answer questions uh, as they come up, if they're relevant to what we're talking about. Otherwise, I'll save them for the end, and we'll ask the questions then. But please, uh, write them down as they come up, if you don't mind. My guess is if, uh, with the time you're thinking of the question, it's probably relevant to answer it, and I'll be happy to do that. So as Ann said, I am a Scrum at Scale registered uh, practitioner, Scrum master, and product owner. Uh, and I'm also uh, just spent a year-long training to become certified to actually, uh, excuse me, registered, and I can get everybody else to uh, teach those classes too. So Scrum Inc. is, uh, Scrum at Scale is the Scrum foundational platform that was built by Jeff Sutherland. Those of you 
that are familiar with Scrum know that Jeff Sutherland is one of the two authors of the original Scrum framework. So this is uh, his scaling framework that he has designed and perfected over the years. I've been very lucky that I've got to work side by side with Dr. Sutherland for the last year or so to get certified. I consider him a mentor. Uh, he's a super nice guy. Um, sometimes if we buy classes, uh, when I teach classes, I can actually even get him to show up at our class and give a um, a little lecture, which is always a bonus. All right, so let's get started. Uh, like I said, my name is Nick Kramer. Uh, I've been doing this for about 12 years or so, and I'm super excited. So scaling in a nutshell. So scaling in a nutshell, it, we hear a lot about scaling out there, and you hear a lot about the different frameworks. There's this one, and then there's safe, and then there's less, and there's the one called DAD or DAD. And these are all really great frameworks. And the great thing about all of these frameworks, if you're using them, is that they are actually 100% compatible with Scrum at scale. Uh, we do take a slightly different approach when we, when we use Scrum at scale and we try to implement Scrum at scale first, and then we bolt on one of the other frameworks or pieces of those frameworks underneath Scrum at scale. I am also certified to teach SAFE, so I know that that is also a great program and works very well uh, with the inside of Scrum at scale. So scaling in a nutshell really means we, when we have organizations that have these projects where multiple teams need to work on one project at the same time, uh, and you have multiple sources of work coming in from multiple areas, maybe different stakeholders, different customers, different executives, different you know, areas of the divisions of your organization are all feeding backlog items into one master kind of backlog or into one project backlog. And then you have multiple teams that you can see here that are working to coordinate their delivery of that work. This is called scaling when we have to take and work with multiple teams. Now you might have multiple teams working on one project. You might have multiple teams working on one product or portfolio, or you might have a whole organization that's trying to make a shift for lots of reasons into Agile, and they're trying to standardize processes across those areas in order to gain some efficiencies. Okay, this is what scaling is in a nutshell. Okay? There really is no exact prescription when it comes to scaling. Every company uh, has their own context and culture that they have to work within. So there isn't a one size fits all here. There's no magic bullet saying, you know, if you want to be, uh, you know, a scaled agile organization, then you got to use Scrum at scale. That's that's not how it works. And you don't have to use safe. You don't have to use this and that. So anybody that tells you you have to do so in a certain way uh, or gets very prescriptive is probably a snake oil salesman, and I would definitely steer you a little bit clear of that. Remember that there are uh, multiple tools that you can use and multiple methods that you can deploy, uh, and they're really all just tools to help us magnify uh, dysfunctions in organizations so that we can inspect and adapt those and make the changes that we need to make in order to optimize across those multiple teams. And then another thing to remember is that our goal should be organic growth uh, throughout the organization. We should be making change at the bottom of an organization and at the top and meeting in the middle. Uh, a lot of scale frameworks ask us to do a big bang approach and say, okay, we're just going to do it. And this is going to how we'll do it. But um, scaling doesn't work that way. It really has to be something that an organization takes on, learns from, grows from, and changes um, as you go. That's the first thing I want to mention. And that the, my one big caveat here is if you do not need to, do not scale if you don't have to. It's that simple. Just because you have multiple teams working on multiple 
projects doesn't need, mean you have to scale. Um, there are a whole bunch of factors that we could discuss at another time that would indicate whether you need to scale. But a lot of organizations sometimes jump the gun and decide they're going to scale when it's really not necessary. Sometimes we can just optimize a few teams and we're good to go and we don't have to dive into this, this effort. So my first very cautionary tale would be be careful when you go into a scaling mode that it's, uh, that it's absolutely necessary. So why do organizations struggle so much to scale Agile? You might have heard uh, lots of stories or your organization might have gone through several efforts to scale or you might even be in the middle of a scaling effort and you might be having struggles or, and whatnot. And there really are kind of four major struggles why organizations can't scale. The first one here is that they can't prioritize. Prioritization becomes difficult. Uh, across an organization. I think I have a slide coming up that says that there's a large percentage of work that we do uh, that is just not important, but because we as organizations have a difficult time prioritizing, then uh, we also have a hard time scaling because we have all these competing priorities and we can't deliver, right? Our teams are unable to effectively deliver in the appropriate amount of time. We can't refactor our organizations. Sometimes our organizations uh, need to go through a cultural shift. They need to make some role changes. They need to change the reporting structures, HR structures, management structures. They need to examine all of that. And some organizations struggle with that, those changes. And then lastly, it does take a cultural shift. If you've done any sort of agile transformations at all, even at a team level, you understand that you know, getting a new mindset in your individual teams can sometimes be a challenge. Imagine what it's like to make that change across the entire organization. Many of us are probably familiar with the State of Agile survey. Okay. Uh, when, when asked, these are the top four reasons that organizations are struggling. Right? Uh, Organization itself is resistant to change. Leadership doesn't participate, uh, which is a huge one. We're gonna talk some about that. And then of course, inconsistence practices across teams, because one team is doing it one way and another team is doing another. It becomes difficult to coordinate those efforts. If you haven't checked out the State of Agile survey, it's on uh, version one's website. I definitely would check it out. It's, it gives you a lot of great information about how organizations are transforming, not only at the team level, but also at this uh, scale level. So teams that are going through changes, uh, organizations that are going through changes, generally understand that there are three levels that you go through. There's this, when you first start off in your waterfall method before you make any change, there's a top-down commanding control kind of mentality that organizations have. As we first start to move into individual agile teams, we move into this what's called command of teams. We allow each team to kind of self-organize a little bit, um, but yet we still have this management structure over them that can be um, a hindrance, but it may not be a major impediment. And this is okay, a perfectly acceptable state to be in, if you're working with individual teams of Agile or Scrum. But as you move to this more scaling model or teams of teams, this is where a lot of organizations have a tendency to get stuck. It's very difficult to make the change into a team of teams, which is just another fancy way of saying scaling. Uh, which brings to mind that really, uh, Trying to scale a broken system just doesn't work. We have to attack the system. We have to attack the culture. We have to make sure that we're making systematic um, approaches uh, when we're making changes. All right, so one of the major changes we have or issues we have when we're trying to scale is this communication overload. When we have two people that are trying to communicate together, communication can be very easy. 
when we have multiple people, like the middle picture here, they're trying to communicate, communication can get um, a little bit more complicated. It's difficult to keep everybody on the same page. It's difficult to make sure that we're all prioritizing together. But imagine what happens when we start to add several teams or even dozens of teams and people into this communication structure. The communication platforms that we need to deploy to keep everybody in sync become very complicated. Um, and sometimes they become almost untenable. So what do organizations do when they need to scale and they need to fix this communication program? They usually look towards a scaling framework. And so one of the more popular frameworks that they look towards is towards SAFE. And this is a picture of kind of how the SAFE uh, model works. And what's really great about SAFE is that they have a solution for everything. They have a way of organizing just about anything. And this is great, except for sometimes, and most of the time actually, for organizations initially trying to make a shift, it's too complicated and it's too bloated. So what I always recommend is if you're making a scaling change, I think SAFE is great, but let's add SAFE on later after we add on more of this cultural framework that we call Scrum at Scale. Okay, so one of the other bigger challenges we have is when we have this, when we have a communication problem is creating linear scalability. And what linear scalability really means that as we scale, or as you're looking at this chart here, as you move to the left, you do not want to lose any efficiencies. But in most organizations that scale, the more we scale, the more we shift to the right, the more inefficiencies we get. And it becomes almost untenable then. That's when scaling falls apart. We had three, four, five, six teams, one, two, three, four divisions. And now our um, efficiency ratios start to drop. We're actually spending more time on overhead. We're spending more time trying to communicate, to plan, to coordinate, and, and the scalability starts to fall apart. Which brings us to the first scaling challenge that I want to talk about today. I have five of them. And the first one is bureaucracy and hierarchy. When organizations start to add more and more teams, more and more complexity, they, their initial thought is to add more and more bureaucracy. And what we really need to do is to find more of a lightweight, minimal, viable bureaucracy that will work for, for our organization. And we will talk a little bit about this minimal viable bureaucracy as we go, but we want to keep the bureaucracy around the teams, the amount of um, management involved, very lightweight. We want to keep the teams central to the process. We will want to, to decentralize uh, decision making as much as possible and shift it back to the teams uh, so that they can do what they need to do. And we want bureaucracy that can support the teams, not the other way around. Teams are not supporting the bureaucracy. The bureaucracy supports the teams. So the less of this bureaucracy that they need to wait through, the better the team is going to be. And we will talk about how we will implement some of that here in just a moment. The next challenge that organizations often face is they create inconsistent scrum practices across their teams. And what happens is when teams start to pick and choose which parts of Scrum they're going to use, uh, it really starts to magnify the deficiencies across the team when we now need to coordinate. Okay. Um, it also makes it difficult if we're not using a standard uh, model to identify impediments and to escalate those impediments faster. So one of the first things that I always recommend is to start with Scrum at its basis, basic, right? We all, I shouldn't say we all, hopefully we all understand what basic Scrum is, where we have a backlog. Each team has its own individual backlog that has a 
product owner that maintains that backlog and is responsible for the value, each increment or each sprint, the team gets together and decides and commits to a portion of that work, which they call the sprint backlog. Then every day, the team gets together for their daily scrum and they do a daily planning session. Then at the end of that sprint period iteration, we do a review where we demo what we completed to the product owner and the stakeholders. And then the team does an inspection and adaption cycle called a sprint retrospective. This is basic scrum where we have a product owner, a scrum master, and a development team that work together. As we start to scale, we want to keep this model as basic as possible. We want to allow the teams to work around this basic scrum model, because it is something that's familiar to teams and it is proven to work. So what Scrum at Scale has done is they have created a model that looks like this. Now, don't be overwhelmed. It's, it can be a little bit uh, frustrating to look at sometimes until you get used to it, but you'll notice there are two concentric circles here. This first circle here is the exact same circle that we were just looking at before at the team level. And the red circle here is what we add on in the Scrum at Scale framework. And it is what we refer to as the product owner cycle. In normal Scrum, we know exactly how teams operate. And so in the product owner cycle, it's where the coordination needs to happen most of the time in order to coordinate those backlogs. So what we do, is we add on this product owner cycle where they can coordinate their activities to make sure that backlogs are aligned with the strategic vision of the organization. All right, so this is what a standard Scrum team looks like. You developers, a Scrum master, a product owner. As we start to scale, our teams may look something like this, right? We have multiple teams in this particular diagram. We have five teams that are all working together to deliver one common goal. Okay? We call these groups of teams that work together in Scrum at Scale, we call them uh, Scrum of Scrums. These are teams that coordinate together. Pretty simple. And we actually create roles that work around these uh, Scrum of Scrums. Each Scrum of Scrums or multiple teams would have a, its own Scrum Master and it would have a chief product owner that oversees all of the work of the individual scrum masters and the individual product owners. Now, this person that oversees uh, these scrum of scrums can be members of one of the teams or they can be an individual, a new person coming in overseeing uh, the team. Okay? But we wanna keep it as lightweight as possible. This is where the minimal viable bureaucracy comes in, so you'll want to decide what makes sense for your organization. Now, as you recall, in regular Scrum, we get together every single day to discuss how the team is doing. Well, in Scrum at scale, we want to keep the process the same, so the Scrum of Scrums get together every single day, and they have what's called a daily um, a scaled daily scrum. Okay. This is where the teams send representatives to a daily stand-up meeting, a daily scrum, so that they can discuss impediments and issues that they might have, and so they can coordinate across those teams. So this works just like the individual team. We're just moving it out one more level. Now, this can, of course, get really complicated. You can have multiple scrum of scrums working around with multiple daily scrum meetings, right? As you start to grow and move into products and portfolios and that kind of thing. But what they all have in common is we create this new role, one of two new roles that exist in scrum of scale. We wanted to keep the new roles as simple as possible. And the first new role is what we call the EAT, the X, X, Ex uh, executive action team. 
So when our individual Scrum at Scrum is teams have issues, they escalate these issues to what uh, is known as an EAT team. It is responsible for clearing those impediments in as a quickly a fashion as possible. Yeah, we'll come to that in a second, okay. So you can see here how the executive action team sits in the middle of all these teams and helps clear the path for them to continue. The second role that we add then is the executive meta scrum. And what executive meta scrum does is it sits on the product owner cycle and it coordinates the alignment of all of the product backlogs. So it aligns all of the product owners together. The EAT aligns all the scrum masters, removes impediments, keeps the team process healthy, just like a scrum team would. The executive meta scrum is the team that manages all the backlogs, aligns those together, makes sure that the teams are working on the right thing at the right time. And please feel free to drop questions in if you should have them. I know this is a lot, but the goal here is to really uh, keep it as lightweight as possible. We don't have any RTE roles. We don't have any trains yet. We don't have any of those fancy things that come from Safe, Less, or, or Dad. We want to keep it with something that everybody knows. Everybody knows how to do Scrum. Everybody knows how to do a daily stand-up. Everybody knows how to do backlog refinement. We just take that out one more level. Instead of having one team do it, now we have multiple teams working and coordinating together. So here's another kind of graphic that we use to describe this. On the one side here is the product owner side where the business is setting up the priorities. They're shifting, sending down all those priorities to the teams that are coordinating together. And as those teams coordinate together, they push those impediments up to the EAT teams to hopefully clear those impediments as quickly as possible. The turnaround time from the time when we identify an impediment until the time we clear it or make a decision about it is called the decisioncy latency period. Okay. This is the gap between the time that we decide we have to make a decision or clear an impediment until the time that that is actually cleared. Now you can see there's been several studies in the last few years that say, if we, oh, that graphic didn't turn out very good, sorry. If we clear a decision within one hour, then the success, the team is 75% more successful if we can clear that in one hour. Whereas if we clear it in five hours, the team is only going to be 21% successful. So the goal of all each teams, all executive action teams, is to clear impediments within one hour so that the teams can be successful and they're not wasting their time waiting on something. So the E team is going to have to be composed of people that are decision makers, that have authority and have influence in order to make and change decisions uh, quickly so that the teams can be successful. That's why we, we have those daily scrum meetings every single day at that scrum of scale level. All right. A third challenge that we often have when we see scaling is the ability to prioritize, to decide what really is the most important thing that we should be working on. We have multiple product owners trying to make decisions. We have multiple executives setting priorities. We have multiple products and programs that are competing for resources, but we really do need to find a way to prioritize those decisions. And that's exactly what the, the Meta Scrum does, right? Um, remember, there are some statistics out there that say that 25% of staff are working on stories that the customer will use. So 25% of our staff is working on something that our customers actually want. 
that our customers are actually willing to pay for. 75% um, of the things that our staffers are working on, according to the Standish groups, are items that our customers will never or will rarely use. If we are spending 45% of our resources on things that our customers will never or rarely use, we are wasting hundreds of thousands of dollars, if not millions or billions of dollars a year on wasted functionality that customers will never use. And as you can see here, 30% of our staff is working on stuff that has zero value. It has completely worked around uh, bureaucracy stuff that has been implemented in order to try to solve communication problems, prioritization problems, scaling problems, all of those things that, that organizations struggle with amount to 30% of our staff's time just trying to keep those things, um, that those processes, that bureaucracy in place. So our goal of scaling is to try to remove as much of this 30% and 45% as possible to try to boost this 25% that we're working on, to make sure that teams are working on the right things at the right time, that they have the right information, and that impediments and decency latency is decreased as much as possible. Okay. So how do we do this at, at Scrum of Scale? So I gave you the, the big chart here, and sure, it sounds super easy, right? We're going to have Scrum Masters work through their cycles. Product owners are going to work on their cycles. We're going to create these low-weight bureaucracy touch points in the middle. We're going to clear those impediments. It all sounds like a, like a magic pill, right? Well, as I said before, it's just really not the case. Uh, but so in order to do any sort of scaling framework at all, we first need to tackle the big challenges of our organization. And one of the things that this Scrum at Scale Practitioner class that we're uh, offering does is it, it creates four, it points out four mega issues, which are here, prioritization, working products, organizational refactoring, and organizational culture. These are four major issues that we need to tackle to make any scaling transformation successful. And we do this through a series of targeted exercise that create a heat map or a prioritization list of where we have issues in each one of these areas. So we do a whole series of exercises on prioritization. How are we doing on prioritization? Are we good at it? Do we need some help with it? Um, and we come up with a score for each one of these mega issues on how we are doing as an organization. We then tackle, I just noticed a typo, my apologies. We then tackle 12 individual components inside of each one of those mega issues. I just realized it says four, that should say 12, sorry. And these are the 12 components that we also evaluate very closely to see how your organization is doing. And when I say we, I mean you evaluate. We will walk you through and facilitate how to identify how are you doing on continuous improvement? How are you doing on strategic vision? All of these kinds of things. Once we have a score for the four mega issues and the 12 individual components, we create what's called a heat map. The heat map then tells us which items we need to target first, right? You'll see at the bottom here, this is a sample heat map. The current component strength, if your component is low, it goes in the red zone. And if it's important to your organizations to fix, you give it a five. And you can see here we plot all the different components and the ones that are in the red zone are the ones that we would tackle first in your organization in order to start implementing change. So this gives us a very targeted approach to figuring out how we can come up with a change management approach 
to implement a scale framework across your organization. And we give you the, school, the tools and the necessary information in order to create these heat maps and to continually review them at both the team level, the program level, and even the organizational level. Because each program might have different things that they need to work on, and each organization might have other issues they need to work on. So we give you the skills in order to continually reevaluate and build a plan that will help put your organization on a solid cultural foundation for a scale framework. Once we have these cultural changes in place and we've built a, a, a minimal vile bureaucracy built around Scrum, then we can start looking at implementing some of the great features that come from the other frameworks like SAFE. Um, I'm working with an organization right now that we've spent a lot of time uh, working through the basic foundations of SAFE, excuse me, Scrum at scale. And now we are in the process of adding uh, some SAFE components such as product increments and trains and uh, design thinking and system thinking and a lot of those great functionality pieces that come from SAFE. But first we had to get the basics down we had to scale at the cultural minimal viable bureaucracy layer so that we could uh, have the underlying foundation to start tackling some of these more complex issues or concepts. All right, so at this time, I'm going to open it up for questions and then and see where we're at. So does anybody have any questions about Scrum at scale? a second here. Okay, one of the questions I have are, what are the new roles that exist inside of Scrum at Scale? It's a good question. So one of the things that uh, as I mentioned before, we really only have a couple new roles and they are actually the same roles at the team level. We just expand those roles out one level. I mentioned the executive action team and I exec ex uh, mentioned the meta scrum that manages the backlog. Uh, we then also have the same roles, the scrum master of the SOS, the scrum at, at scale teams. And then we also may have a chief product owner that would oversee multiple product owners to keep them in line. But these are essentially the same roles that exist at the Scrum level. So we don't need to come up with a whole bunch of new roles um, other than to manage the, the EAT and the Meta Scrum cycles. So it's a great question. Uh, that's one of the great things that about Scrum at scale here is that we don't have to have a whole bunch of roles, new roles. We don't have to go through a bunch of training. Uh, to, to understand what those roles are, because hopefully your organization already understands Scrum uh, and these roles and responsibilities are pretty clear to everybody in, within the team. Excellent question. Another question is, do you have to implement uh, another framework on top of Scrum at scale? And the answer to that is no. So you do not have to tackle safe or add any of those components on at all. Uh, you can see here, here's an example of an actual Scrum at Scale team that we have worked on in the past. That is, you know, multiple layers, multiple um, teams, you know, multiple coordination points. And this particular organization did not implement in anything but Scrum at Scale. They decided that they didn't need to do trains they didn't need RTEs. They didn't need any of that stuff because they decided in order to keep the bureaucracy small and in order to allow the teams to do their work at their level to centralize, decentralize that decision-making to where it needed to be, they did not need to implement SAFE. So oftentimes, Scrum at Scale can be just enough. 
Excellent. Another question. Is it possible to implement Scrum when the organization is in a very dynamic moment or in an immature in methodology aspects? Yes, it is definitely possible to implement Scrum you know, in a team as immature in methodology process uh, or in a dynamic moment. And the reason why uh, it's possible, and it's, sometimes it's even preferred to implement Scrum, is because Scrum allows you to change priorities and to shift quickly to meet your customers' needs. Because we're only working on, uh, say, two week sprint cycles. That means that we lock in the work that we're doing for two weeks. At the end of the two weeks, we can evaluate what we're doing and we can then replan for the next sprint, which gives us the opportunity to shift our goals if we need to. So if your organization is in one that is dynamically changing all of the time and is uh, needing to shift priorities or shift your you know, your mindset and change all those things frequently, then Scrum actually can be a good thing. It builds that that mindset of constant change into your teams and gets them used to used to that. So I would recommend Scrum for that for sure. Excellent question. Another question here. One of our organizations, excuse me, one of our organizational challenges is our top leadership want goals to find a year out. And for Scrum sometimes doesn't fit well with that. What strategies would you use to help define those larger goals to scale to smaller goals? Yeah, uh, smaller goals for development teams. Sorry, cut that off. Yeah, oh, I've never worked for an organization that did not uh, want to set yearly goals. I think, I think it's common for most large scale organizations to say, uh, we are going to set these goals, and I. But it's also not uncommon for most organizations to not stick with those goals for a year. So one of the great things that Scrum and Scrum at Scale does is it allows us to define things long terms using product backlog items that are at a higher level. So there are user stories that we define at the individual scrum level right those are the requirements that we're going to build uh, scrum at scale then has what's called epics and features which are larger items larger backlog items that we can define and prioritize now of course we're not going to go into all the detail at those levels that we would at a story level but it allows us to at least sit down and define those to create a vision for those products and even sometimes to scale, we I have a uh, scale. I mean, to, even to estimate those, I have a scaling system called MAC estimation points that we can use to to estimate those larger items so that they can be prioritized. And then the senior staff, the executives, can then decide which of those they want to slot into the next year. The great thing about defining those at the feature and epic level for your yearly planning is it gives enough room to change as you go, uh, as you start to refine those down into user stories and requirements, it gives you enough room to shift your goal. But I actually recommend, and Scum at Scale recommends that you define those goals. Give your team the vision of where they need to be in a year, give them the North Star that they're working from, uh, and then trust the teams Give the teams the information they need based on those epics and features to deliver on those goals. So it is not incongruent to plan it a year out. It's sometimes even beneficial because it allows, gives that team that North Star to work towards. It's a great question. Another question here is, how do you do inspection and adaption cycles across um, Scrum at Scrums? It's a good question too. So that's just like uh, the Scrum, daily Scrum that happens at the team level. We pull that out one level higher when we're doing a Scrum at scale here. Uh, when we're here and we're doing that Scrum daily Scrum, 
We do the same thing with a retrospective is we pull one of those out and we have one of those at the scrum of scrum levels every iteration also. So we would get together, members of the scrum of scrums team get together and decide if there are any process improvements that they can make for that particular area. And then we escalate any impediments that we're discovering to that executive action team to have them cleared as quickly as possible. One tip that we always recommend uh, in this framework is a concept called scrumming the scrum. I don't have any slides on it, but what scrumming the scrum says is that every team during their retrospective should get together and come up with a process or improvement or Kaizen thing that they're going to work through. They should define that item as an actual working story. So let's say that your team is having a problem with code quality and they come up with a process improvement that they want to institute uh, code reviews after every story is done. You actually write a story uh, and define what your deliverable is going to be for that story. And you discuss that story in every single scrum, excuse me, every single daily, daily scrum, the scrum, the stand up, and you ask every person on the team, how are they doing on pushing this particular item forward? At the end of the sprint, you do the same thing as you would with the norm normal story. You actually demo the results to the product owner and team to show that you all um, we're committed to making the change that you made. And if that the change worked, great. If it didn't work, then we go back to our retrospective and we reevaluate and readjust the story for the next sprint. But this way, it keeps it on the mind of the team. It keeps it on mind of the, the, day, uh, the scrum of scrums team to make sure the teams are staying accountable for process improvement and that they keep these inspection adaption cycles at the forefront of their mind all the time so that they can whittle away at that bureaucracy and continually keep it as small as possible so that the teams and the scrum of scrums maintain autonomy over their areas as much as possible. Good question. Another question. Um, what do how do you get access to the estimation tool as we have epics, but management wants to know an end date before they put resources to a project? I've had to come up with a formula to estimate based on high level epics. Does Scrum have a standard so I don't have to create these formulas? FYI, the formula did work and we delivered on time, but it seems the process should account for this. Yeah, Scrum itself does not have a estimation uh, point for uh, epics. It's something that we have come up with on our own. I'm happy to share it with you. Do I have my email address? If you're interested, I can give you my email address. And if, if you wanted, we can definitely have a conversation about it. Here, I'll drop the email. Or we could even have an, um, another webinar. Maybe that's a good another webinar and to have is how to estimate epics and things. We'll put that on the backlog. It's a good topic. Um, yeah, so we got two people that are interested in that. Oh, one, same person, sorry. Um, what was another question? I lost it. Sorry, okay. I, I know that was the same person asking me the same question, or two questions. So the couple big takeaways that I'm hoping we can take away from this is that um, Scrum at scale is really a lightweight format uh, framework that we use across the enterprise. It is not necessarily strictly for technical projects. The Scrum at Scale model is meant to drive organizational change and to try to reduce bureaucracy as much as possible. It's a way of creating and empowering teams to work and coordinate together with the fewest 
and the smallest amount of bureaucracy possible um, before we start to add all the bureaucracy that comes with some of the other frameworks. Most organizations I work with find that Scrum at scale is enough, it creates enough of that minimum bureaucracy to move forward and to be successful. And we have implemented, I should say, not we, Scrum at scale has been implemented at some of the largest organizations in the country. I am personally working with two major insurance companies to do it, and I know several of the car manufacturing um, companies use it, and it is um, widely used across the largest companies in Australia. It is uh, one of the most popular uh, and Scrum at Scale frameworks because it is so lightweight. So that being said, our time is up. I want to thank everybody, unless you have questions, I can stick around all day. I want to thank everybody for coming. If you are interested in a Scrum at Scale class, uh, just send an email to info at accelerate.com and we will be glad to provide you with more information. I also should say that I do do private webinars um, to, to organizations for free. So if your company would like a private webinar on Scrum at Scale, uh, reach out to this number and we'll be happy to do one. Uh, sometimes uh, you have a targeted thing, you want me to talk about sort of something very specific. We can definitely do that. Any final questions? This has been great. Yeah, you had some really great questions there, Nick. This is Anne again, by the way. Great job. <laughs> All right. If that's it, I want to be respectful of all your time. I'll be around if anybody wants to chat. Otherwise, I really honestly appreciate all of your time and attendance. I know you have valuable time. So have a great day and definitely reach out to us. Uh, we'll be glad to help. Yes, thank you so much, Nick. And thank you everyone for spending this hour with us. Nick, I'm sorry, I'm just going to take presenter just for one quick second because I just wanted to say one very fast thing. Um, uh, you know, if you enjoyed this this one hour with Nick, the, the only thing better is a couple of days with Nick. Um, so I'm just going to go here to our Agile page, Agile training. You'll see we do have a ton of Agile courses, but the one that maps the best to this webinar is a Scrum at Scale Practitioner. I also put the URL in the chat. Um, but in the next couple of days, with Nick's help, we're going to get a couple other classes up here. Registered Scrum Master, Registered Product Owner, and a Scrum at Scale Foundations for our seminar. Um, but yeah, this is the class that sort of just maps to this uh, this webinar. And so if, you, if you're interested in the class, you can come here. If you click Request Pricing, you'll just get our our contact information and our form um, and we'll get right back to you and right after this webinar ends i'm going to end it in a second you'll be getting a little evaluation pop-up and if you've got time we would really love it if you could please fill it out we really read them we take them to heart and this is also a chance for you to tell us what other webinars you'd like to see i know we had a one comment and so nick we're going to hold you to that next webinar <laughs> i'll be in touch um, <laughs> so if you've got any other you know ideas for great agile topics, please let us know or anything else. And um, thank you again so much for your time. So Nick, thank you for spending this hour with us too. We really appreciate it. Um, so I hope everyone has a wonderful rest of your day. I'll go ahead and end this now, but um, please contact us if you need anything. Thanks everyone. Bye-bye.